Okay, so this is our mental coding exercise here. We want to think through a simple client server UDP application. Okay, and <clears throat> the application will be a little bit different from the ping application. Okay, so basically the send side to client is um, going to send as much data as fast as it can and the receiver is going to receive as much data as it can and there's a couple of things that that'll let me talk about um, that go uh, one step deeper into uh, how UDP sockets work. So, uh, actually it might be easier if you get out a piece of paper. We're not going to turn this in or anything. But, um, to identify the init type uh, socket routines that are required in this motion at both the client, the client and the server. So, uh, and we don't, we're going to skip the details of setting up the address and like all the data structures, okay? And, uh, and also we're going to skip the details of creating a Rx buffer and that kind of thing. What we're after is identify these sockets calls. Um, and so I'll, I'll start off. We know that as a client, one of the first things it's going to do is it's going to create a socket. And similarly at the server, things that it will do from a socket perspective is it will create the socket. And on the socket calls that you identify, don't worry about the parameter names or that kind of thing. It's, um, what, what I want you to do is just step through in your minds what happens at the client side and what happens at the server side for a simple application where the sender is just sending all the time and the receiver is just receiving all the time. Okay, so let's work on that for a few minutes. 
Okay, so let's actually start at the server side. Okay, so after the um, after the socket call. What would we expect as far as socket API calls? So the most likely the server is going to be passed a port number. Right. So the to complete this endpoint of the socket, there needs to be two pieces of information. What is the IP address, and the other is the port uh, Okay, the, we assign effectively both the IP address and the port number um, when the server code issues a bind. So basically it's one of the parameters, well, the parameter um, on the bind is the server side address, which includes uh, either a effectively a wildcard, which tells the system um, if there's multiple interfaces, which means there's multiple IP addresses, to associate all of those addresses to this socket endpoint. And then the bind will uh, also set the port number that is the other piece of information that's required um, at a socket endpoint. <laughs> and so this is done uh, independent of the client, right? So the uh, client that tries to interact with a server that hasn't been started isn't going to be a very successful client, right? So um, let's assume that the server um, in our, when we talk about this, is running, starting first, does the bind, and then what would we expect the code to look like here? Right. So basically, it'll enter a loop. So if I how do you all use while when you know you want to loop forever? So again, this would be um, the, uh, the address structure that's associated with a name, uh, something that is uh, returned from the call to uh, get add or info, right? It basically returns a list of, of addresses. 
of structures. Yes. So I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is a pretty like, basic question. So bind returns a number, right? Bind returns just in a, a normal Unix return code. So it's either a negative one, one or a on error one. or a zero for success. Okay. And so then you can go ahead with that. I was going to say, so since bind returns a normal Eric's, or sorry, um, I've always seen it where the socket is just stored as an integer. So uh -huh. does bind return something different and cast it to an integer, or is it natively an integer? I'm pretty sure it's natively an integer because every time you, people use bind, always see they have yeah. bind and then it has less than, if it's less than zero, then it's an error. Yeah, I always see this in sock and then check yeah. something similar. Yeah, and when we look at this code, we'll see um, it, there's, uh, it's a, effectively doing if the return code from bind is less than zero, um, handle the error. Right. It's negative one is the error current. Right. And then <clears throat> um, we'll be able to learn what the error is by looking at the magic global variable called error node, which uh, so you can actually do a printf, print it as a decimal, um, and it will give you a number, right? One through probably 10,000. And there's, um, you can find the file called errorno.h, which contains the text for each possible error. Uh, there's, uh, there, uh, you could do a sudo apt install a program called errorno. And when you run it, you just give it the number and it gives you a text description of that error. If you wanted that text <laughs> description to be displayed as a part of your code, you, this is an error condition, you, you would use a library call called pERror. Second part of my question was receive from. Do you not have to pass in the socket? Yes, my bad. Uh, I was making sure. Yeah. So what the thing we get back from the socket is the socket. Uh, and that's an integer, right? Right. So it's a. It's a. Uh, well, it's a. There's a. Unix type for it, but it's basically an integer. And it's no different than like a file descriptor. So will that contain like what my protocol is using and all that kind of stuff? Um, it contains, it basically will be, um, it will point to the socket information that this program server side is using. Contained uh, within that socket information would be these um, pieces of information. Or, okay. Right. And so that's a really good lead-in to where I'm heading with this. Also contained within that socket information is going to be a couple of buffers. Okay, so...
So as data in the form of IP datagrams travel through the pipe and end up at the endpoint of the socket, basically this is a host. And you know, we could look at the TCP IP layering. Um, data that arrives is going to be placed in the RX buffer of, that's associated with the correct socket endpoint. Okay, so <clears throat> if a client starts sending and our server program is off doing something that's not yet started receive from us. All of that data is going to be inserted into this RX buffer. Uh, we have control over the size of that buffer. Okay, we'll be looking at the call to uh, learn what the size is and to change what that size is. So there's a, a another sockets API call is uh, set sock option or something like that. Set sock opt. And there are literally, literally, literally a thousand things that we could tweak with the socket. The, the things that I tweak the most would be to set the RX buffer size and the TX buffer size to something that makes sense to the application. So, um, the question was, yes, on receive from you need a SOC. So SOC would be a variable that we declare um, and it's uh, holding the actual socket button descriptor. Okay, um, so we're in this tight loop, received from um, the I just call it RC. So the return code coming back from received from again to to get the details of any uh, system call, you can always do a man, and then the, the name of the call received from. And at the top, it would always give the syntax of the call, and it also gives the possibilities of what is returned. Okay, so received from, um, if there's an error, it will return a negative one, and error no will be set accordingly. Otherwise, I believe it's going to return the number of bytes that was received. <coughs> okay. Um, so <coughs> we have to put this parameter, max buffer size, to make sure that we tell the system our buffer is only this large. And one of the things that we learn after the receive from, so we not only get the data, it's going to be placed into our buffer, but the address of the sender is going to be placed in the from address structure. So we're being told the address of who sent us this data. So that's how a server is able to learn the client's information so that if it needs to send something back, it has all the information it needs. Okay, so let's see. The only thing to add here would be a uh, close of the sock. Whenever we spin out of this 
loop. Um, when we do a control C of a program, all of its open descriptors, whether they're sockets or files, are going to be closed. system will set the port for us, uh, and it will set the address for us. If we do set the bind, we may want to set a specific port number for whatever reason. That would be very application specific. And we may want to, we may want to specify the address at this endpoint. So again, this gets into the complexity of, you know, there could be multiple addresses associated with a single name. There could be a host that has multiple interfaces, which means there's multiple addresses involved. A client can issue a bind and specify, I only want to use one of my three network addresses, or one of my three interfaces. And again, we that would be a specific situation that might require that. Yeah. So is, it, is that basically what port forwarding is? Uh, I mean, people talk about port forwarding and stuff. Yeah, so we'll come back to that. Yeah. So. Okay, so that, cover that. Right. So a bind that the client is optional, we probably won't see examples of it in, in our code. Um, what's the next thing we'll see at the client here? 
Do you just go straight to the exactly. well? Basically, at while, so you can make it true. Okay, so on the send to, we have to specify which socket. We have to specify the a pointer to the data, tell the system how much data to send, um, and then we have to provide a pointer to the server address that we're interacting with. So this serve address would be filled in in the code that's above before we issue the socket. <coughs> okay. So the return can be, again, if it's a negative one, it would be an error. And we could look at error no to find out what the reason is. Um, and so in some of our examples, we've talked about if we wanted to set an alarm or a timeout, and this is more for the ping application, we would issue alarm of some number. And if, when we got to the receive from, we blocked, and if we didn't get the return within that alarm time, um, we would pop out of the receive from with an error, and the error no would be specific, and it would indicate that the alarm popped. And on a send to, so we typically would not, um, in this example, in this application, we would not deal with an alarm or a timeout. So um, we would, and we'll do this in a second, we'll issue a man of send to to see the possible errors we might expect. Otherwise, if it is zero or greater, I believe it'll be the number of bytes sent. Um, okay, so when we create the socket, uh, we, as we said on the server side, we also create a Receive buffer and a TX buffer. Okay, this is impossible to read. I'm sorry. So this is within the socket information. There's a TX buffer and an RX buffer. These buffers are different from our application TX and RX buffers. Okay? So, when we're in a tight loop doing sends, we are likely to fill this buffer very quickly because we can insert packets at a rate faster than the system can pull out those packets, send them down the stack, out the link to be transmitted. Okay, the default behavior for a send is when we issue a send and this buffer is full, we're actually going to block. Okay? 
So, <clears throat> it sort of regulates itself so that the application sends at the speed that the network will support. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the text buffer exists on both sides of yes. so both the client and the um, and the server side. Right. right. So a socket endpoint, right, always has its own adder information and pair of buffers. Okay, and that buffer is the exact same buffer that's able to be accessed from the client and the server side. So okay, that's a really good question. So like the TX buffer. Okay, so the, um, you know, let's say our, our code here is likely to have now a single buffer of, let's call it a thousand bytes, okay, and we're just going to send it over and over and over and over, okay, so this, the socket TX buffer will be filled with datagrams, or sorry, will be filled with, with data that um, uh, that indicates it'll be actually a, put into a container. Um, and so it's a thousand bytes will be unique. Um, so that when the system IP layers raw the next packet to be sent, it'll get the next thousand byte message, put it in an IP datagram, and send it out. And then that ends up with this RX one. So this, I think I see what you're trying to get at. This TX buffer is independent of this TX buffer. Because a socket is bidirectional, it's full duplex. So we can actually code an application to be sort of a client and server at the same time. They both are sending to each other and they both are trying to receive the stream. Okay, so the client can send out data faster than the system is slower than the network and the client system, and so you know, a packet that arrives at a socket endpoint to find a full RX buffer is going to be dropped. And this would be congestion. Yes. Is that what would happen if the server would not be fully plexed? It was fully plexed. It would just drop the packet. Uh, yes. All right. So even even in this case, in this scenario, it's really a uh, unidirectional application, um, and the exact same thing would happen, right? So so the client comes in, overflows the RX buffer, and packets are are dropped. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what's the point of the H to N and the H? Okay. Calls? That's a great question. So, let's say that in our message, we are including a sequence number. Okay, and um, the sequence number will be 
use our code example, is four octets. It's a unsigned 32-bit integer. Uh, so <clears throat> let's say that the sequence number that's going to go out on the next message it is, I'm going to make up some weird W here, this is going to be an X, X, 0X, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, which translates to some large number in, in decimal, but it helps us see each octet, okay? So, um, on a little Indian machine, like in uh, the x86 PC things, um, x stored in low memory, so we'll say memory address of 0x10000, zero 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 zero, and then 1, 2, 3. Um, on a little Indian, the least significant byte is stored in low memory. So it would be stored zero <coughs> My watch is telling me to move. <laughs> zero one. Um, okay. And then on a big Indian machine, it's the opposite. So the in low memory, the uh, most significant octet is placed. Okay, a networking protocol architecture has to decide how bytes are laid out in the network because we'll have big Indian and little Indian machines talking to each other, and so there has to be a commonality. So TCP IP is, uh, they call it the network byte order, is big Indian. So network byte order. And so if we draw a frame and imagine we're, we're going to ascend of a message thousand bytes with a sequence number of 0, 01020304. 0, 0, 0, 0, okay, the frame, so we know this is at the link to the MAC layer, so there's a MAC header which contains machine addresses and um, other pieces of information. Then there's the payload which is going to be our IP datagram. And then there's four bytes of CRC. So in the payload, the top part is going to be in the IP datagram header. This will be the IP header. The next part would be UDP header, and then the next part would be a thousand bytes of data. And the first four octets are going to be our sequence number. So visualize low memory is this way. Higher memory is this way when you're thinking about a frame. So, network by order, Big Indian says you place the most significant octet first or in low memory. So, that sequence number is going to go 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04. If we were to look at the first four octets, that thousand bytes. Um, I'm a desperate reader of the theorist. All right, so let's say.
say that when we pack the buffer with the sequence number, so we're going to we're going to have a pointer that's going to be defined as a uint. <coughs> Fill in that first UN32 for the sequence number. We'll do star my int PTR equals. And we'll assume that this is the variable holding the sequence number to use. Okay, to make sure that we pack the network buffer in network byte order will use the macro host to network log sequence number. And this code is going to work one way on a big Indian machine, it'll work the opposite way on a little Indian machine. But from our program perspective, it'll do it correctly. Okay, so that's the job of, in this case, we're packing the network buffer, so we use host to network block. Wow, that was a full class. Um, okay, this was good. I, hopefully this gave some better foundations for what we're talking about. All right, I'll see you all later.